sure, but I think by the sounds of what's coming out of the toy room, I think most of the church is in there already. It sounds like there's about a thousand of them in there. We did something a little bit different the last few weeks, and uh, this is the third week of it. And uh, after this week, we're going to move to something that's a little more typical. Yeah, I don't know if it's completely typical. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit for the month of November and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But the last couple of weeks, we've been leaning towards an event that will be remembered on Tuesday of this week. Yeah, there's, there is a big secular thing that's going to also happen on Tuesday with the kids running all over with costumes and things like that. Maybe lost in that a little bit will be the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years ago, Martin Luther went to his church in Wittenberg, Germany, took a hammer, took a nail, and took a couple of sheets of paper with what he called the 95 Theses. 95 things he wanted academics just debate in his university, hammered it to the church door, and set off a revolution in Europe. I was, uh, just before I started getting ready this morning, I was, I was checking news headlines just real quick, and I noticed there was a news headline on there, one of the sites I looked at, that made reference to the fact that this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther this week, and I hope it does get a little bit of attention. It should, because it's an event that shook the world to its very core. And they were just coming out of a time that was often called the Dark Ages. I know I've often seen that the reason why they called it the Dark Ages there were many knights, K and I changed. Yeah, that's a tough job. Uh, anyways. Um, time is often called the Dark Ages. Maybe not always rightly called that. There were different places in the world with different churches. The the whole church wasn't united under the church that was headed in Rome, but much of Western Europe at least was. And Luther comes along, and he sees abuses. He sees a church that is oriented around power and money, and in many ways was starting to turn its focus towards the glory of of humanity, and he saw something wrong. He was a man who was racked with guilt, who just saw himself in front of a holy God as an imperfect person and looked at himself as one who there was nothing worth redeeming. He saw no hope until somebody said, Do you know what? Why don't you start teaching the Bible? And as a man who was a priest and a monk, he would have thought he would have read a Bible, but he had never picked one up in his life. And he sits down and he reads the book of Romans and he becomes convinced that he is not righteous and has no hope of righteousness because of what he does. But if he has faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, he will know righteousness. Because the only way to be right before God is to believe on Jesus Christ. I read one book. I've read a couple of books on the Reformation. One book I've been reading the last little bit ends with these words. For us today, the Reformation has sparkling good news. News of an enjoyable and satisfying God. A God who lavishes his love on those who have not made themselves attractive to him. A God whose love can liberate the most broken and the most guilty. What Martin Luther discovered in the Bible pulled him out of despair and made him feel he had entered paradise itself through open gates. Nothing about that message has changed. Nothing.
about that message has lost its power to brighten lives today. I want to tell you, I, I said last week, and Martin Luther was not a perfect man. He had a lot of failures. You read some of the stuff he wrote early in his life. He was, he was remarkable, and he started reaching out to his Jewish neighbors, and something happened midway through his life. He became very anti-Semitic. He was not perfect by any stretch. He got manipulated later in his life to bless a marriage of a prince who was already married and therefore had two wives. Yeah, he, he made some mistakes. He, uh, at times, was very intolerant of people who did not agree with him and get very mad over very minor, unimportant pieces of theology. But I'm going to tell you right now, that was exactly what the church needed. Because churches walk, you know, people, authority in the church are walking around. They're telling everybody, you need to listen to every word we say because we're perfect in the sight of God. We've got it all together and you people, you don't. The masses out there, majority of people, you, you don't have a right, we do. You gotta listen to us all. Here it comes along an imperfect man. One who had his struggles and I'm going to tell you, we needed an imperfect man at that time. There was a feeling out there that the church existed for its own sake. And you know what? If you were part of the church, if you were part of the hierarchy, if you were part of the structure, you were good. If you weren't, if you were part of the, particularly the peasant masses. Now, if you, they, they wouldn't say this to a king. But if you were a peasant, they would tell you this. Maybe if we're good enough and you follow us closely enough, a little bit of grace might sprinkle into your life here and there. Maybe a little bit of our goodness will overflow and you'll catch a little bit of it. The church existed for itself. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 read this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Find that humility and then go out and spread the love of Jesus is basically the idea there. It is so easy to fall away from that, to become arrogant, to retreat into ourselves, and forget that our primary goal is to sit at the feet of Jesus. And when we've done that, we come away refreshed and we're ready to go out and serve others. <coughs> And if the church is not doing that, basking in the love of God all the time, and then going out and loving people, we need a reformation again. We need that knock on the door of our heart. Something I described a couple of weeks ago out of the book of Revelation. That's exactly what happened in the Reformation, where Jesus stands at the door of the heart of the church, knocking when we let him in, comes in, we eat with him. It's the glory of God comes into our lives. And you know what? Continually, we need this reformation. In Luther's day, the church retreated. There were a lot of good people. Not a, there were a lot of others who were reading the Bible, who were seeing the things of Jesus. But they were hiding often. Don't hide. The world attacks. The world will always attack. And the only answer is to be found in caring for people and helping others. Verses I read out of Philippians, they're tied, if you read them, I encourage you to go home, read the whole chapter. They're tied to Jesus and saying, this is, this is how Jesus acts. 
It is, isn't it? Humble? Helping others? So Jesus came to this world. And the call is for us to tie our attitude back to Jesus. Many people that stood for truth in the years leading up to Luther, some paid for it with their lives. And it's so easy sometimes when the world is being nasty to us to want to retreat back, to fall back. But we are called to live for the truth. And if it costs us, it costs us. Our natural attitude might be, if the world attacks, is to attack back. Maybe we do one of those two things. Maybe we either hide or we attack back. And neither is the call of God on our lives. In humility, we value others. And we look out for others' interests. I was reading a sermon the Luther preached, a rather famous sermon about Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? He's the guy who runs away. Jonah runs away. He's not doing what God calls him to do. He's hiding. He's scared. And it's only when he finally confesses to all these sailors that he's sailing with that it's me who's in the wrong that God is able to use him. And then when God gets hold of him, he goes off and he goes to tell people that they hated, people called the Ninevites, they were the enemies of Israel, he goes off to them, he proclaims God's, but you know what, he's not happy with the results. Because they start to turn to Jesus and he hates them, he doesn't want to turn to God. It's not the call on his life. You know, it's a remarkable story because God calls Jonah. Jonah fails miserably. He confesses. He goes and does the job that God calls him to. He's not happy about it. But do you know what? God works despite his failures. God works despite his failures. That is the story of where the church is supposed to be going. Because the gospel will move on. I know some may not be all that excited about historical stories, but hold on, I'm going to tell a few more. In days not long after Luther, the word started to flock out. You know what? You could read the Bible for yourself. There was a lady in England, young girl, 19. Why don't you remember this throughout the story? 19. She was of the upper class. Her name was Lady Jane Grey. Lady Jane was convinced that uh, she should be picking up the Bible. The problem was the only English Bible that exists up to that point was written in very old type of language and was really hard to get. It was actually illegal. So she decided, well, I know the simple solution. I'm going to learn Greek and Hebrew. She did. Mm -hmm. 19. Decided to teach herself Greek and Hebrew. Some women aren't getting much of an education. Teach herself Greek and Hebrew. Realizes the same things that Luther realizes that the church needs to come under Scripture, that it's about the grace of God and the grace of God alone. She had a cousin by the name of Mary. Now, Mary happened to be married to the king. Not a particularly good king. The king was a gentleman by the name of Henry VIII. We're going to come to him again in a minute. Uh, Mary had a nickname, Bloody Mary. Now, some of you are thinking that was just an alcoholic beverage. No, it's actually named after a person. Mary sent a, a priest to kind of talk some sense into her cousin who was reading the Bible. How could you? So, Put a proper spin on things. She got her arrested so we could have a good talk with her. Kind of threaten her a little bit. Throws her into jail. The leading scholar from the church comes along. Sits down with this 19-year-old and says, Do you know what? 
You want to be right with God. Your idea of faith, that, that's fine. But the only way to be right by God is by faith and being obedient to the teachings of the church. Can you say that? And she said, no. No. It's only by faith. And she used the Latin phrase for, for actually only faith, sola fide. He said, do you know what? If you come to church and you are served the bread and the wine, that becomes the very body and the very blood of Christ. And she looked at him and said, no, it's important to do that, but it's just symbolic. And he looked at her and said, well, at the very least, can you affirm that the church's authority is at least as important as scripture? And she looked at the 19-year-old girl, looked at him and said, the church sits underneath the piercing gaze of God's word. Those were the words of this 19-year-old girl that taught herself Greek and Hebrew. Her cousin Mary ordered her execution. February 12th, Jane was brought to the White Tower of the Tower of London. Small crowd and executioner awaited. She cried out, I do look to be saved by no other mean but only the mercy of God in the blood of his only son, Jesus Christ. She knelt down, recited Psalm 51, that begins, have mercy on me, O God. They put a blindfold on her. Jane then stood up, kind of pushed them back a little bit. I don't know how she got away with this. Pushing back those who had incarcerated her with a blindfold on, walked up the platform, groping to try to figure out where she was supposed to be, found the block on the stage. Without any pressure or pushing, put her head on the block to have it chopped off. She cried out her last words, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so ended the life of Lady Jane Grey, the teen martyr. Do you know what that did? It meant everybody wanted a copy of the Bible. It went like crazy from there. All sorts of different groups started to emerge. In, in Germany and in, in Holland, there was a group called the Anabaptists. Um, Mennonites would be the famous group that come out of this. Who taught that you were saved by grace. They reintroduced the idea that one is baptized as an adult. Who saw a communion as symbolic. Luther actually really didn't like these guys. But they saw themselves as flawed people in a flawed world who, despite the fact that they were flawed, could bring the kingdom of God to this world. Being told that uh, you're probably familiar with the Amish people of Pennsylvania and that region. I'm, I'm, they're famous for their, their, their furnitures and their quilts and all sorts of things like that. If you go down there, I'm told if you buy something from them, there will be a deliberate flaw somewhere that's hidden, to show that they are flawed people. <clears throat> but that the kingdom of God can still be brought about by flawed people. As they're coming up in Switzerland and France, the Reformed Church is coming up alongside people by the name of Zwingli and Calvin. And, and Calvin is, John Calvin is a brilliant man. Uh, of all the reformers, probably the one theologically I identify the most with. And yet somebody who made a lot of mistakes along the way. Had a burning intensity for the glory of God. He studied the scripture and said, we need to apply it for our day. And he looked around and he saw the peasants, who everybody else thought were unimportant. And he taught that they were princes because God had made them. His children. He tried to get them to live as princes, and that's actually where he went off the rails. He was obsessed with making sure that they acted like kings. But he was a great man. He had a passion for the glory of God. In England, all sorts of people are becoming consumed with the idea of God's kingdom. There's a man 
around the same time as, as Lady Jane Grey by the name of William Tyndale, who described this great discovery in his life where he said, um, good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings that maketh the man's heart glad, and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy, are found by reading the Bible. He wanted others to be able to read it. So he set about his life goal of translating the Bible into English. He had to flee eventually to Germany, where it was a little bit safer to work, eventually ends up in, in Belgium and in Holland and a couple of different places to keep moving along. Eventually he comes up with the first, or not the first, it's actually the second, but the first of his generation, English Bible. It's the Gospel of John as he wrote it. Try to read that. In case anybody thinks the King James is a little hard to read, this is Tyndale's Bible about 150 years beforehand. It has whole letters that we don't use anymore. Uh, and John is spelled very different. And I don't know if you can see it, it says, that actually does say Gospel of St. John. And underneath it, it's the first chapter, and boy, does first ever spell differently. I don't know if you can read it from there. It's much better, though. There was an earlier version. There was a man by the name of Wycliffe. He came around. He for his first one tried to translate the Bible in English. Even 120 years before that, he came up with that. Uh, good luck. Anyways, that, that's kind of English. Wycliffe got away with translating the Bible into English. Uh, church at first didn't see a big thread in it, but as the Reformation starts to grow, they put Wycliffe on trial for translating the Bible into English. They actually dig him up out of the, his grave, put him on trial, and bring in prosecutors, and then tell, ask him, are you going to defend yourself? Well, he's dead. He's been dead for 100 years. He doesn't defend himself, so they condemn him, and they actually execute his corpse. Go figure I can't explain that, anyways. Tyndale, however, keeps going. Teaches himself Greek, Hebrew, translates the Bible into English, becomes an accurate and, for their day, easy to read version. We can't read it today, it's really hard, but it turned out to be a great thing. It was illegal, but he managed to smuggle 16,000 copies back into England. <coughs> October 1535, so this is as Luther's now, his Reformation's a few years old. They capture him, put him on trial, sentenced to death. He's officially strangled just outside of Brussels, Belgium. His last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Henry VIII was the King of England. He never does become a good guy, but that prayer is answered because two years later, Henry VIII allows the Bibles to be put in churches. He never becomes the good guy. I'm going to say some more about him in a minute. Six Bibles are put in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. They said for weeks afterwards, the priests complained because nobody was listening to them. They were too busy all trying to read the Bible. They would read it out loud to each other excited that they had the Word of God in the English language. The message, the gospel, the excitement was spreading. Yeah, Henry VIII, he never does become the good guy. The church, the Protestant church is growing like crazy in England. Henry VIII, you may know the story, he gets into dispute with the Pope as to whether he'd get divorced or not. Henry says, well, fine, I'm going to become a Protestant. First, everybody in England is really excited about that. Then they realize all they really want to do is try to take over the church and become Pope himself. Causes all sorts of problems. It leads to the, the head of the Protestant Reformation in England, Thomas Cranmer, being executed. Cranmer, because he tried to keep Henry from being able to control the church. 
bleeds in England to a high church, a low church, low church, we have to call the Puritans. As the church continues, and the Reformation continues in the 1600s in England, there was another knock on the torch's door of Jesus knocking on their hearts because it had become again a political thing. And the church had become under the control of politics. And people sat there then and read their Bible and said, hang on here, there's something wrong. They're just trying to make us feel guilty again and forgetting to tell us about grace. And there was a man by the name of John Bunyan. He came along and he sat down with the scriptures and he discovered that the guilt that he was feeling was being placed on his heart was wrong. It was wrong. He saw the hope of Jesus. He was thrown in jail for us, trying to reform the church. But he said this, my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself. The same yesterday, today, and now forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loose from my affliction and irons. Now went I also home rejoicing for the grace and the love of God. This morning in Sunday school, one of the kids said, uh, we should watch the movie Pilgrim's Progress. I said, hey, I'm going to mention this in church. He's a man who wrote a book about a Christian who just needs to get rid of the burden of sin desperately and finds all sorts of ways in which the world tells him he can get rid of the burden of his sin, but he discovers there's only one way, and it's at the cross of Jesus. The church keeps growing. Passion for the world of God is great, but at times Jesus keeps having to bring reformation. Puritans eventually end up in the New World. They go through some really legalistic times. And they start getting distracted by all sorts of things they shouldn't have. You may have heard of something called the Salem Witch Hunts. Example of where they went off the rails and all of a sudden became consumed with trying to find sin everywhere. Eventually, a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards steps forward. Leads the Great Awakening of the 1730s, where passion had started to, to disappear from the church, and the church starting to go astray. And he gets up and he reminds them that the only thing that keeps us from hell is not our actions, not trying to prove to God that we can find evil everywhere and chase it away. The only way we're kept from hell, and these are his words, is by the sovereign and majestic one. Don't worry about everybody else's failures. Keep coming back to the majestic sovereign one. Around the same time in England, a man by the name William Wilberforce, he is the rising star of parliament. He is tied to the prime minister. He is, he is, everybody is looking at him, figuring he's going to become a future prime minister of England. He starts to become convicted of his sin, and a man by the name of John Newton, probably heard a few of his words. He wrote some words that went like, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, now I'm found was blind, but now I see. You may have heard those words. Wrote those words. He sat down with William Wilberforce, brought him to Jesus. William Wilberforce spent a couple of weeks learning about Jesus, studying the Bible, came, looked at John Newton and said, you know what, I think I need to leave politics because power corrupts. William Wilberforce said, or, or John Newton said to William Wilberforce said, do you know what, stay in politics but do not care for power. Do not care for power. And he went on to tell him about his days as a slave trader and how he would go to Africa to help capture human beings to take them across the Atlantic and sell them for profit. And William Wilberforce, 
then spent 20 years as a member of parliament getting pushed to the sidelines because all of a sudden he cared about one thing and that was ending slavery in the British Empire. He kept getting told over and over again it will destroy the economy in the colonies. We cannot do it. After 20 years, he finally managed to see victory. And then, didn't sleep a night of victory, didn't, didn't get excited about the victories won. Instead, he turned around and spent the next 20 years fighting that all the people who are already in slavery be freed. He eventually won. He was known as the conscience of England. Same time as Wilberforce is doing that, there's a shoemaker in England by the name of William Carey. He starts looking at the Bible and realizing, you know what the church is not doing? It says at the end of Matthew, we're to go into all the world. We're not doing it. So he goes to the church and says, I'll tell you what. I'll be the miner who goes down into the mine. You be the ones who stay at home and you, you hold the rope that keeps me safe. But I'm going to India to proclaim the gospel. There are a lot of lost sheep, and he's looking at a quote that Jesus makes in, this, in the Gospels. There are a lot of lost sheep out there. There are a lot of people who need to hear the Gospel, and right now in, England, in India, England's starting to exploit people and use them. We need to go there and tell them that actually Jesus loves them. I'm going to go find the treasure that God has for us in India. The church continually needs to be challenged. A few decades after those two gentlemen, a time where, on the one hand, the economy is doing really well at the end of the 1800s, and at the same time, while the economy is doing well in, in Europe, in North America, there is starvation, there is poverty, there is a type of informal slavery that has started to build up. When a mighty movement of God in the 1880s starts to sweep through both North America and Europe, a chance to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, a statement that if the Holy Spirit is part of one's life and we allow him to work and to fill us fully, we can go out and change the world. And gentlemen by the name with names like William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, stand up. In New York, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson, starts a movement, be filled with the Spirit of God, and then go out and change the world. Since then, we've seen all sorts of threats to the church from liberalism to communism to fascism. We've seen challenges to the church in North America, and I think God has been often knocking at the church's heart in North America, and I think sometimes the door is being slammed shut. But in Africa, in Asia, South America, the church has been growing by leaps and bounds. And changes have been made to hearts because the gospel's moving forward. And we've come to realize that the church is not about becoming European, but about being transformed by Jesus. I think the church has a challenge in the year 2017 to understand that it is about Scripture only about finding Jesus in the Bible and not our own reason and rationale. We have a challenge of understanding it's only about grace. And salvation is from grace only, and not about our morality, our worldview, or even our politics. That it's only achieved by faith in Jesus. That salvation exists in one place and one place only, and it's 
when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. And maybe more importantly than anything, we need to get back to the idea that John Calvin had back in Switzerland in the 1500s, that we are to be passionate about God's glory only. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this a little bit in our next sermon series. But ever God works, there's kind of five stages in history. It starts with a turbulent time for believers. It moves to a time of genuine repentance away from sin and towards God. That it comes a time of rapid church expansion and ministry to the poor and disadvantaged. Followed by a great outpouring of music and worship. And a fifth phase where the world pushes the church back to conformity. Think about that fifth page for a minute. Where are we at? We need to continually to keep coming back to the scriptures for the purpose of finding the majesty of God. And when we stop as a, as a church, we will falter, we will fail, God's call is on us to continually be bringing his love forward. And as the 21st century continues, every single believer in Jesus has an obligation to keep searching for the majesty of God so that we can keep expressing his love. God is knocking at the door of the church. Stagnation happens so easily. There is only one way forward, and it is to continually, as the church, not to say that we have to move forward, not for me to get up here and say we have to do better. There is only one hope for the church, and that is to continually bask in the love of Jesus Christ. And as we find his love and look into his glorious majesty, that's when Reformation continues. Let's commit to be like Jesus. I'm going to invite our worship team to lead us.